So we just turned in our creature composites. We finished unit five. Now we move on to unit six, which is not an exercise. It's not an assignment. It's something called a proving ground. To understand a proving ground, we actually have to go to modules because proving ground is not my term. And then you wonder why does he have something in his class that's not his term? That's because we are doing kind of a separate curriculum or an additional curriculum on top of the course credit for the course. And this is for a 21st century marketable skills badge in creative problem solving. So if you can earn this badge through the semester and you can earn the badge but fail the class, you can pass the class but fail to earn the badge, you know, they're, they're intertwined but inter, inter independent. Um, this badge is meant to go onto your resumes, onto your social media. It's going to be linked to credentials. It's called a micro-credential. And it, it's proven to be an area that's considered marketable for 21st century jobs. So this is creative problem solving for more than just digital art. This is creative problem solving for being like an innovative, innovative communicator, an innovative marketer, whatever it might be. You can also print it. So how do you earn the badge? To earn the badge, you have to complete all the proving ground assignments. That's what they call these badge assignments. There are four of them through the class. I don't get to write the rubrics for them. I just have to get to decide how the assignment is formed and how it applies to the rubrics. But you have to meet all criteria of the rubrics and receive at least 80% on each of them. And if you receive less than 80%, you can redo it, retake it, by the end of the semester if you want to earn that badge. But you still have to meet all the criteria. All right. And you can see this as the last module of the class. We'll be doing this at the end of the semester. These are the, the four proving grounds. The first is all about identifying patterns. The second will all be about exercising convergent and divergent thinking. The third is managing ambiguity. And the fourth is applying an, iter an iterative process. So, we have not earned any of these yet. We need to start these. So, if I go to unit modules and go to our first proving ground, it will introduce what we're doing. We're going to demonstrate a mastery of basic compositing raster files using all necessary tools and direct adjustments. We get to put all our skills together now. We're going to utilize appropriate layering and digital format integration to create a clean and seamless composite image. We're going to become familiar with non-destructive overlay layer editing to add shadows and highlights. I'll probably show that to you beginning of next class. We're going to understand how to glaze and add atmosphere and texture overlays to improve overall engagement and believability. I think I'll get to that today. And then this is where the, the proving ground stuff comes through. We're going to make sense of the data, the resolution and digital presentation type of your artwork. So we've talked, about, we've talked about resolution a lot. We've talked about physical proportions a lot. We need to be able to state that clearly and understand how that ties to real world use. That's understanding the data. We have to recognize commonalities among seemingly unrelated situations. So we're going to do that by matching the light direction and the angle of anatomy of our creature within the composite of the landscape, how we place them, how we light them, how we place them, how we pose them going to have control of all those things. And we're going to frame novel problems in familiar terms. So we're going to do this by answering with writing, with our submission, how does your creature interact with its environment, right? By reflecting on your artwork in new ways. Even if your creature has nothing to do with your environment, we're going to find creative ways to make those connections. Strictly speaking, you do not need to use assignment one and assignment two to do this project. You can use a found landscape and a found fantasy creature and composite them together and still meet all the criteria of the proving ground. But it's a lot more rewarding if you can do it with your own work, right? Not only do you keep copyright of it that way or earn copyright for it, but you'll have the opportunity to improve both your composite landscape and your composite creature. This is what the end product will look like all of this in one post, what I call a creature scape, which is a composite creature on a fantasy background. Underneath it, you're going to say what its physical dimensions are in inches. 
And you're going to say what its pixel dimensions are for its resolution. If it's a reasonable size, larger than 8 by 10, at 300 pixels or more per inch, then it is what's considered standard print resolution. Right? If it is less than 300 pixels per inch, but still larger than 8 by 10, and at least 72 pixels per inch, then it is considered standard screen resolution. And you have to label that. So that's the making sense of data part. That will get you the first 0.5 points of the rubric. The next is you have to write a description of how your creature survives in this environment, right? So let's skip down to some of these. So in this one, uh, the image that ended up with this project was 10 by 10 inches at 72 pixels per inch. Why is it so small? Well, because they actually cropped down to a small part of their landscape because they wanted their creature to be going in and out of the water. And I require that your creature is at least 25% of the image, right? Because we're not going to hide it in the background. Like I said this morning, we don't want to wear as Waldo this. You know, you want your creature to be pretty prominent. There is a loophole for that, however. If your creature, you want to remain small in a large landscape, you can make many duplicates of your creature. <laughs> but that makes more work for you because you have to match the lighting and the anatomy and the angle for all of them. Does that make sense? All right. So anyway, whatever you end up with, you want to notice if it's at 72 pixels per inch or 300, and if it's larger than 8 by 10, and then you have to identify it as either screen resolution or print resolution. And then you give a description. So this description, a single plutonic plate worm can subsist in the bleakest and most inhospitable of environments by absorbing and digesting its own dying skin cells as they are constantly being damaged by cosmic radiation. Preferring planets with a minimal protective atmosphere, the higher the toxicity, the larger they can grow. They can survive in extreme temperatures and require no light or breathable atmosphere, often accompanying frozen asteroids or smaller planetary bodies. So what's cool about that is some of that is evident in the image, but not all of it is. It's getting you to kind of manage the creative unknown and find connections. And that might give you ways to improve the image or even think of how you can expand upon it. All right, we can find more examples here, the ones that were made into final portfolio pieces. This is what's called a non-destructive editing layer. We're going to learn how to do that. And you can get a sense of these things, some instructor examples. All right, now you can also go on the YouTube and find my past tutorials on proving ground number one. So, yep, it just goes back to the past examples. Okay, so now, what if your creature does not fit your landscape? As long as we can match the lighting and the angle of the anatomy, it's going to work. So my example is Space Jam, the 1996 movie. But you can use Mary Poppins. You can use like any kind of combination of, of hand-drawn animation and live action. Notice how these creatures, though they look very, very different, right? They have cast shadows. They have highlights. They are in perspective with the shot that's live action. So they are made to, to be believably in that space, even though they don't look like they belong there. And so we are used to this. We see this all the time. Here are the actual rubric criteria. You want to get full marks for all of them. And if you don't get full marks, I'll show you what correction you need to make, right? In order to get full marks by the end of the semester. The one that includes digital art is this second one. Recognize commonalities among seemingly unrelated situations. You are going to place your PNG creature file, your clean cutout of assignment two, onto the landscape background image and I would recommend putting it into your PSD landscape file of assignment one so that you can sync it behind certain layers in a way that utilizes a common light direction and accommodates for the angle of your creature's anatomy. The other things we add after the fact. So we're going to do this by adding cast shadows, by playing with atmosphere, 
and by understanding how to embed our creature into the environment. Right? So here you see some examples of where students in the morning class got to. But it's not due till next class, and we're going to try to really do a good job at this. So let me go to the right Canvas course and navigate to it. You can also jump right to where you post it under Assignments and go into Proving Ground number one. All right, so what do I need to do first? I need to grab my landscape. So I'm going to find that. This is a great opportunity to organize your work. In my class folder under Assignment 1, I am looking for the working file, the Photoshop document that has all the layers. It's right there, marked green. So this is the most finished landscape I could come up with. But this is an opportunity for me to work with it and improve upon it. Next, I want to find my assignment to my clean PNG, the best PNG I have. This is an opportunity for you to clean it up. And if you make improvements, you can resubmit it. So this is what I'm going to do. First, I'm going to make improvements to assignment one. This is how I recommend everyone start because we've gotten better at compositing. So I look at this now and I squint, and I think, you know what would be really nice? If I had a little bit more separation between this foreground element of these french fries and this mid -ground, middle ground element of this, this roasted duck. And you know what, a, if I've looked at compositing artists, and you know what trick they always do? They do something called texture overlays. Because yes, you can composite with solid things like mountains and rocks and boulders, but you can also composite with low opacity things like scratches or lighting effects, lens flares. And a lot of these texture overlays can be used for like scratch or scrapbooking, making things look old, but some of them are dimensional. And this one's from Pixabay. Right. So if we go to Pixabay, which I love, because I, I don't have to quality check them so much. Let's just go right to Pixabay. It's already a shortcut in my Google. And I search for what kind of texture do I want? I want something that's kind of smoky and misty. So I'm just going to look for a cloud texture. And I've got lots of them. So what's going to work with my fast food? Oh, this is interesting. This is done with suspending ink in, in clear liquid and doing high-speed photography. I think that's interesting. I think this one's interesting. I like how moody it is. So I'm going to download both of these. It doesn't even matter if they're done large. So I'm not even going to do the largest. Because these are all about soft atmospheric effects. You've already filled in your whole landscape, so this is going to be building atmosphere. I'm going to grab those downloads. I'm going to move them into my Assignment 1 folder, because they might be useful beyond just this assignment. And because they're Pixabay, they have a Pixabay license, so I don't have to worry about that. But I'm also going to make them unrecognizable. Drag and drop it on. Put it on top of everything to start with. Transform it. Oh, I should do this in Photo P for you. Sorry. Let me save it. Open this up in Photo P because we're the freeware class. There are disadvantages to using freeware, but there are significant advantages too, even beyond the cost sometimes. But you want to make sure your assignment doesn't have any layers that it doesn't need to have. You know, that you delete any extra layers, that you've cropped it down so that you're really using everything that you have a layer for, you know, to help photo piece processing. Okay, now I'm going to take this and I'm going to edit, free transform it, just like we've been doing a lot. And I'm going to hold down shift and just really, really mess with this. Like stretch it like it's clouds rolling. 